Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Larsine. I'm a very, very grateful member of Al-Anon, and um, I want to thank Don for the invitation to be here. Hey, uh, Larsine, it says you're unmuted, but we can't hear you quite yet, so well, I, yeah. anyone else hear her? I can hear her. I hear just fine. Shall I go ahead? Am I good now? You're good. I know. That, that, that's the new slogan now. Can you hear me? So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I'm good to go now. So anyway, so my greetings to Mount Baker and, uh, and your conference and yay for you guys for going ahead and doing it. Um, I know this whole thing is like wackadoodle with the COVID and all the isolation, you, but, you know, and I know it's crazy, but as far as I'm concerned, I don't know anybody that does crazier better than us, okay? I just like it's not an unfamiliar suit, so um, I, don't think it, I don't think it's that hard, you know, the difference between now and the old crazy is this crazy is I've got 12 steps that I get to apply, and, uh, and, and it keeps me off the crazy train, which is, which is where I don't want to be. So anyway, my thanks to Don for the invitation. Thank you for having Alan on at your conference. I am most appreciative of that. You know, I tell people, I'm sorry, we can't all be alcoholics. You know, some of us have to just, you know, hold the world together until you guys get sober and take your rightful place as rulers of the universe. So um, that's just our little contribution to you. Um, it's always a little difficult being the only Al Anon speaker at an AA conference. I liken that to like being the corpse at an Irish wake. Uh, no one uh, expects you to say much, but they can't have the party without you. So here we are. And, um, and I want to thank the speakers so far. I mean, everybody's just been just good stuff. I'm always amazed and I'm so, so grateful um, that I can hear good stuff now. Um, that wasn't so much the case when I got here and that I hear such good stuff from alcoholics is even more amazing to me. But um, I, I enjoy AA. I absolutely love AA. And, um, you know, and I know that you guys, you know, with the speakers that you've had so far and who you have coming up is such a great, great lineup and so much hope in these rooms, so much incredible hope. And, um, and that's, and that's, I think, what always sees us through. So, um, yay, yay to the committee for putting everything together and making it happen. You know, life doesn't stop happening for any of us. And, uh, and so it's good that we can have these opportunities to get together. And uh, um, just so, you know, Steve knows, Georgia set you up really, really well. So if you screw up, that's all on you, dude, because she did great. So I just want to make sure. <laughs> You're not hanging her out to dry. So, <laughs> but anyway, I'm just going to tell a little bit about what it was like, you know, what happened and what it's like for me now. Um, I came in Al Anon in June the 6th of uh, 1981. And um, I grew up in an alcoholic home with a, you know, but as a kid, you know, I don't know that you know that you're growing up in an alcoholic home. It's not like you're born and you get this brochure that says, hey, your dad's an alcoholic and this is going to explain a whole lot of stuff. You know, I didn't have any of that going on. I just, uh, I was a figure out or, you know, my dad was a master sergeant in the army. And so uh, he pretty much raised our family just like he did the troops in the army. We had little army bunk beds. We had foot lockers at the end of our bunk beds. You know, we were expected to, um, you know, be able, my dad would come in and do room inspection and pop a quarter on our bed and all that kind of good stuff. We'd open up our foot lockers. Our gear had to be stored so, so, so. You know, and I remember being a little kid, three and four and five years old, standing at the end of my bunk waiting for my dad to, to salute me, and then I would salute him back. And um, and it's just kind of the way that it was. But, you know, and, and I have some, now because of the program, you know, I can look back at some of that with good memories. But I tell you, when I got to Al-Anon, there were none whatsoever. Because um, like I say, my dad was an alcoholic, and I had no idea what that was about. And um, I used to wonder as a little kid why someone would go to all the trouble to marry someone and then have children just to yell at them and hit them and make them feel bad about who they were. You know, I could never quite figure out what that was about. And I never, you know, my, my understanding of it is because, because we always grew up in military housing with lots of other military families. And let me tell you, there were lots and lots of moms that had broken arms 
and black eyes and no one ever said or did a dang thing about it, you know? And so my interpretation of all of that was, it's just the way it is. It's what dads do. You know, dads just, they get drunk, they hit you, they yell at you, and it's just the way it is. And that's how, and it's not just for me, it's just the way that it is with everybody. And when you start growing up with that information and you start believing all of that stuff, I mean, how I get affected by the disease of alcoholism and I'm not the alcoholic, you know, again, is the the lie that's the disease of alcoholism. This is the way it is. There's nothing you can do about it. You have no choices. I mean, those are the things I think that the family disease of alcoholism starts pounding into you right, right from the very, very beginning. And um, when I was new in Al-Anon, I went to so many open meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, it says in our Al-Anon literature that you should learn all you can about the disease of alcoholism. And I know no better place to learn that than in open meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I remember, um, you know, being at one of those very first AA meetings and the AA speaker that night, he talked, his whole talk was about alcoholism, the family disease. And he described alcoholism, the family disease is like having a rhinoceros in your living room, but everybody pretends it's a coffee table. And if I have to describe the house that I grew up in, boy, that's the house that I grew up in, because we never talked about nothing in our house. I mean, it was just the way it was. And, you know, we'd be at the dinner table and my mom would know that my dad was ready to blow. And, uh, you know, but she could never say to us kids, okay, everybody be quiet. Don't talk because your dad's ready to blow. Because if she said it out loud, of course, my dad would blow. So my mom would speak to us facially you know, and if you grow up in an alcoholic home, then you know that when your mom is at the dinner table and she's, you know, you know, shaking her head and making her eyes really big and doing all that freaky stuff, you know, it's not an epileptic fit. It's my mom giving all the kids the warning, don't talk, don't move, you know, nobody do anything. And, but if you have an alcoholic that's ready to explode, absolutely nothing is going to deter that from happening. And, and even though we would all be rigid at the dinner table, You know, somebody would scrape a knife on a plate or just spill a little bit of milk, whatever, just some really, really minor, minor infraction. My dad would go ballistic, you know, and dinner would go flying. Um, Everybody would get a beating. Everybody would have to go to bed six, you know, five, six o'clock in the afternoon. Everybody goes to bed. My mom, the kids, the dog. It's just the way it goes down in our house. And, uh, And I remember the next morning getting up and creeping down the hallway to go into the kitchen to have breakfast before I went to school. And there would be my dad drinking his breakfast beer, like he did every morning. And uh, you'd walk in there, and uh, no one ever said, gee whiz, dad, what was that about, dad? Gee whiz, how come you had to hit everybody? How come you had to throw everything? How come you had to break everything? You know, and you just went back to hoping that today will be different. And the rhinoceros went back to being a coffee table. And if I have to describe the house that I grew up in, boy, that's the house that I grew up in. And, uh, you know, and in school, um, you know, I was in every club, every possible thing I could be in in school, because that was the only way I didn't have to come home. And that was my goal was never to come home as much as I possibly could not. And again, what I did to avoid all of that, I mean, I joined everything. I participated in everything. I mean, I ran track and field. I hate running. I hate track and field. If you've ever run hurdles and you've missed, that is a big owie, okay? But I would do that rather than go home. I mean, that's just, you know, again, and I don't even know that I'm doing those things. You know, how I get to be affected by the disease of alcoholism, I have absolutely no idea that that's what's going on, you know, in my house. I just know that it's just an awful place to be. You know, and as I got older, of course, I was able to attribute my dad's drinking to what was going on, you know, but, but by then I'm just so affected by it all the time, you know, and this is where I have no qualms with how, you know, it says we become sick too. You know, I liken growing up in the disease of alcoholism is like having a bowl of crap in front of you. And I don't think there's anybody in this room that'll sit down and eat a bowl of crap in one whole city. But I'm here to tell you from my experience, I'll choke down a teaspoon every single solitary time if it'll just make it be quiet. You know, if it'll just whatever it does to shut that up so I don't have to participate in it and how I get affected by the disease of alcoholism. And, uh, you know, and it was just the stuff that, you know, just went on in our house. I mean, it's crazy, you know, and that's why, you know, the whole thing for me, you know, with Al-Anon and stuff, what I've got to really learn over the thing is about just not getting on the crazy train. But when crazy is your normal all the time, you know, every day starts out so innocent, you know, and it's just like, and you can get called into the house, and you come in there and just get told some information by your dad, or you can get called into the house and 
the next thing you find yourself on the other side of the room and you have no idea what happened or what started that or who said what or do whatever, you know, and I was raised in a house where it was all about the problem, who started it, you know, when that's the stuff that's going on in your house every day, the focus is always on the problem, who started it, whose fault it is, who's going to take the blame for it, you know, so how I'm affected by the disease of alcoholism is, is all I know to do is focus on the, on the problem, never on the solution. There isn't a solution to this because you never know what's going to happen from day to day. And as the big book, you know, so aptly des- describes, it's a disease that gets progressively worse, never better. And, um, and so anyway, uh, you know, we always lived in the army, always lived in military housing and all that stuff. When I was a teenager, we moved to Southern California and, um, you know, and up into that point, I'd only ever lived in military housing, military families, you know, moving to California in the 60s was really, you know, I mean, talk about no rules and regulations. And I was the one who was just my whole life was rules and regulations. California in the 60s, big hippies and free love and all kinds of stuff going on there. And us girls are getting old enough to date. and It's really hard to date in my house because my dad has a lot of rules and regulations about dating. And we bring home these little weenie guys home to meet my dad you know, and my dad is a master sergeant, you know, and he's got that master sergeant voice. My dad is over six foot tall. He has one eyebrow. He can raise like six inches off the right side of his forehead. So he always looks like the devil himself standing there drilling you, you know, and he would drill these little boys about, you know, you know, where he, where they were taking, you know, his daughters, you know, it's just like, you know, where are you going to go? When are you going to be back? And then he would tell them, you know, um, about what uh, part of them he would remove if we were not returned in the virginal condition of which we left the house in the first place. So it was almost impossible to get a second date at my house. It just like almost never, ever, ever happened. Uh, You know, and the fact that my dad always had a hand grenade or a gun in his hand never helped the situation either. But again, one more time, you know, to everyone else that may seem bizarre. But, you know, when you grow up with that, it just became normal behavior in my house because my dad was always going to blow up the Helms Bakery guy or he was going to, you know, kill the neighbor, whoever had him pissed off for the day. You know, but again, how I get affected by the disease of alcoholism is I accept that that's, you know, that that becomes acceptable behavior. And why? Because I'm living in crazy and I have to justify and rationalize why it's okay for me to live like this, how I am affected by the disease of alcoholism. Um, You know, I need to let you know that my dad ended up dying. He died when he was 55 years old, and he died the death that they talk about in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, total insanity and death. Um, I can't tell you the last words my dad said to me because they were so vile and so vulgar. I would not begin to repeat them. There's no point in it. But uh, again, what I've I've gotten to learn, you know, being in Al-Anon is that, uh, you know, I used to always say those were the last words my dad said to me now, when in reality, what I know are those really the last words my dad's alcoholism said to me, you know, because before alcohol took the life of yet one more person, it spit out the ugliest crap it could possibly do. And, uh, and that's the disease of alcoholism and how I am affected by the disease of alcoholism. You know, and when my dad died, my mom had long since divorced him. I'm the oldest. So I had the power of attorney for his health and all of that kind of stuff. And I remember me and my sisters being outside that hospital room and the doctors coming and telling us, you know, that our dad had passed away. And I would like to tell you we were sad, but we were not. My sisters and I were like, ding dong, the witch is dead. Da, da, da. You know, and I don't tell you this story because I'm proud of it. I tell you the story because this is where the family disease of alcoholism will take a family, you know, because we'd rather that this person be dead than live in this hellish hole one more day than have that person who dominated us, threatened us, always going to kill us, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, and but the most amazing thing to me that happened that day is see my sisters and I really believe when my dad had died, you know, that it was over, you know, and all that happened that day that I know of is that the alcohol had died. The disease of alcoholism was alive and well in me and my sisters, absolutely positively, without a doubt, how we had been affected by the disease of alcoholism. You know, and how I know this is because at this point, you know, my dad died in October, he just celebrated an anniversary of his passing, October the 13th of 1981. I started coming to Al-Anon in June of 81. So June to October, I'd only been coming to Al-Anon, but a few short months. So I wasn't anywhere into loving and forgiving. None of that stuff was going on for me now. I was just still scoping out Al-Anon. And, uh, but I was working a program and I, and I had a sponsor and, um, and I was working the steps, doing what I was told to do, doing it to the best of my ability. Yet after my dad passed away, 
and I, you know, and again, thinking it was over because he was gone. Um, anytime anybody, you know, there'd just be some instances I'd be somewhere and someone would talk to me in a tone or just something would just trigger, you know, just that, you know, reaction I would have to dad, any, any kind of embarrassment. My dad was big on humiliation. Um, you know, I always tell alcoholics, you know, that, uh, if you've ever been to a school function and your drunken father showed up, you know, then pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization isn't just reserved for the alcoholic. And my, and my dad, as much as I took a beating from him, I mean, the humiliation and embarrassment he used to subject me and my sisters to was nothing compared to that. So, and, but somebody would talk to me or say something and would make the hair on the back of my neck go up and my dad's dead now. It's nothing to do with him, but boy, it would piss me off all over again. I would remember certain incidents. I would be whack a doodle you know and I don't know how you are but when I am really pissed and just like eating it you know I like to take that home and share it with my husband and my children and the people that I love and care about the most because isn't that the family disease of alcoholism it's exactly what it wants you to do spread it out spread out the misery spread out the pain and if you can get the neighbors involved extra points for you I mean I mean again it's just the insidious disease of of alcoholism and I'm going to Al-Anon at this point and I don't want to be doing it and, and I don't understand why I'm still doing it. And I mean, mind you, it hasn't been that long, but you know, I am not unlike anyone else that comes here. Boy, I want the answers. I want the answers now. I want to get on with it. Let's, let's move on through. And I remember talking to my sponsor going, God, I'm doing everything. I'm doing the steps and I'm still yelling and screaming, hitting my children, you know, things I don't want to be doing. You know, why isn't this working for me? You know, and I remember her telling me, you know, Larsine, it's because you always focus on the problem. You refuse to not look at the problem. And Al-Anon isn't about the problem. Al-Anon is about the solution. And she goes, and if you want to get past this, I'm going to give you an assignment and you're not going to like it. And she always prefaced it with, and you're not going to like it. Because I have never liked one weenie stupid thing they have ever told me to do in Al-Anon. Because I bring, bring, bring huge, huge problems to you and I get weenie, weenie answers. You know, you go to a meeting, you lay your door, oh my God, this is happening and that's happening. You know what you hear in an Al-Anon meeting? Let go and let God. Easy does it. You know, one day at a time, which seems like the stupidest stuff. Have you not just heard my horrible problems and you want me to easy does it? Let go and let God. Where's God when all this crap is happening? Blah, blah. Of course, that's all that negativity that's in my head all the time. You know, what I've come to find out in my years now and on is just exactly how I am affected by the disease of alcoholism. Because the disease of alcoholism doesn't let me accept what's going on. It doesn't even let me look at the truth of what's going on. Because how I am affected by the disease of alcoholism is something happens, not good, whatever it is, a flat tire, you know, but I just don't let it be a flat tire. I envelope it into, I need a new tire. A new tire is going to cost me this. I don't have this. Then I'm not going to be able to pay the rent. We're going to get kicked out. You know, I mean, I just, you know, it just magnifies it to whatever because the family disease of alcoholism doesn't want me to think I have any choices. It doesn't want me to think that there's any answers to my problems. It wants me to live in the problem. It wants me to think my problem is going to kill me. You know, and again, that's what would happen. And then I would take it to my sponsor and my sponsor would say, what's really going on right now? And I would tell her. And then, and then she would say to me, well, do you have an action to take here? And if you do, we'll take that action. And if you don't, then there's no action to take, you know? And then, and then when I started looking at what was really going on in my life and just exactly the truth of what is happening right now, guess what the answer is 99% of the time. Let go and let God, easy does it, one day at a time. Who knew? It's all true. I mean, it seems like when you come in, that's just stuff they're just throwing at you or whatever, but they're actually telling you the truth right out of the gate, you know? And again, how I am affected by the disease of alcoholism is I wouldn't know the truth if it slapped me in the face. And, uh, and again, it just takes that experience. This is Georgia and everybody else has been talking about, you know, it takes what it takes until you find, yeah, that is the absolute positive truth. But anyway, my sponsor says, I'm going to give you an assignment and you're not going to like it. And this was about my dad. And she says, I want you to go home and I want you to think about a good thing your father had done for you. And my initial reaction is, you are out of your mind. There is no such thing. Are you, did you not hear me tell you in my fourth and step and all out, you know, fifth step about everything that he did to us and blah, 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 blah. You know, how, how am I supposed to think of a good thing my dad has done for me when my first remembrance of being alive is fear at my father's hands? 
that's my first memory of being alive. And I'm supposed to think up a good thing because again, I'm focused always on the problem. The family disease of alcoholism wants to keep me in all that negative thinking left to my own devices. I will make a good day bad. It's just the way I am a hardwired for. And, um, you know, but one thing I learned right out of the gate, when I first came to Al-Anon, I heard someone share at the meeting that if you're not willing to do anything different, how can you possibly expect anything to be different? And for whatever reason, I heard that and I believed it and I still believe it today. You know, I believe that was God's grace for me. And, uh, you know, and you have to have some willingness or nothing's going to change. Now, I, I'm not a giver. Let me tell you that right out of the gate. And all Al-Anons, they talk like, not me. I am not a giver. You know, it's just like I will question everything from one side to the other side, you know. And, and my willingness is like as close as you can get these two fingers together without them actually touching. Because I'm not going to give you an inch. You're going to have to prove to me over and over and over again. But again, I believe this program is so powerful. You only need the tiniest bit of willingness, but you do have to have some. And so I was willing. That's all she just, she asked me to be willing to think of a good thing my dad had done for me. So I was willing. And I don't know how long it took me, a week or two. And I remembered that my dad taught me how to drive, you know, and uh, and believe you me, if you're gonna live in Southern California, marry an alcoholic of your own and track that sucker down, it's just a skill you gotta have, okay? And I'm talking about tracking alcoholics down, no GPS, no cell phones, none of that gizmo stuff was going on. I'm talking about just good old putting yourself in a car and finding someone that doesn't want to be found. And, um, and we're pretty good at it as far as I can tell. And, um, and I didn't think that my sponsor would be happy with that answer. I really and truly didn't, you know, but it was honestly the only thing that I could think of. And, um, and I sincerely hope, you know, that uh, AA or Al-Anon, that if, you know, you're in these rooms that you are sponsored, um, I can't say enough about sponsorship and, uh, and what it's done in my personal life, because, um, you know, to me, a sponsor is like having your own personal rooting section. It's amazing to me. I mean, they just rooting for you all the time. They want you to do well. Lots of reasons, you know, when you're doing well, you're not such a pain in the butt. And, uh, and, you know, and when you do well, you know, you do good, they look good. I mean, it's like a win-win situation all the way. I don't, I don't know why you wouldn't do, you know, the direction that they give you, but um, I have always been sponsored like that. And I'm very, very grateful for that. And, you know, and I remember going to Jeannie and I said, well, I thought of a good thing my dad had done. And I said, but you're not going to like it, you know, cause already I'm on the negative on the problem. And this isn't going to be the answer. And I said, he taught me how to drive. Oh my God, you would think I had come up with the cure for cancer. The woman was freaking ecstatic. You know, I mean, she didn't care what my answer was. She just wanted to put me into the solution. Of course, I didn't know that at the time. And it was my rookie year in Al-Anon. And I didn't know when your sponsor gave you an assignment that there was going to be part two. Okay, because let me trust you, there's always part two. And now part two of my assignment was whenever I thought, about something my dad did or said, you know, that brought me pain, that made me feel bad about myself, whatever the deal was, that I was just to replace this negative thought with this positive thought, this one good thought I had that he taught me how to drive. And, um, and then my sponsor went on to tell me, she said, you know, your father died with all of his children being grateful he was dead, happy about it, no less. You know, can you accept, you know, you're a mother, you have children, do you want to die like that? You want to die with your children being glad that you were dead? Or can you accept the fact that your dad was just a sick alcoholic? And not only did he pay the price of his life, he also paid the price of, his, of having his children be grateful he was dead. Do you really need to punish anybody more than that? You know, and one more time, it's into acceptance. My sponsor went on to tell me, you know, what, what all you need to know is that your dad loved you as much as his alcoholism would allow him to. Nobody can love you more than what you what they are allowed to do. And, uh, you know, and I don't mean to say that I grew up with this hellacious dad who beat us, made us feel bad about being girls and all this other head trip he put on us. And then I came to Al-Anon and I did this freaking weenie assignment that my sponsor gave me. And now it's rainbows and butterflies out my butt. You know, that is not what happened to me at all. You know, what my sponsor did that day is what I will always be eternally grateful for. And one of the best gifts I think that we get from Al-Anon is she gave me the gift of forgiveness. And it says in our Al-Anon literature that forgiveness is no favor. We do it for nobody but ourselves. And see, again, I come with the misconception that if I forgive you, I'm letting you off the hook. And I uh, wasn't going to let him off the hook. He was, bad, but he was a bad guy. He did bad things. You know, and Al-Anon has never, ever tried to tell me that any of it was right 
or any of that. What Al-Anon has always just told me is the truth. You grew up in an alcoholic home with an alcoholic father, you know, and, and it got, and the disease in your house got progressively worse, not better, you know, and now what are you going to do? The choice is yours, you know, and again, left to my own devices, I'll live in the pain. I'll yell at my husband and I'll yell at my kids and I'll let the family disease of alcoholism continue on, even though, you know, my, my father is long passed on. And so, uh, you know, and so, um, Anyway, you know, fast forward again and, you know, and, and, you know, so my dad's died and, um, and so they bring me his ashes and, uh, because, you know, and and my dad was a World War II veteran, a Korean War veteran. I got the flag, you know, medals, all of that kind of stuff. I happened to be home alone that day. They bring me all of that stuff. And I took my dad's ashes and I went downstairs and I have the laundry room behind the garage. And so I took him downstairs and I put him behind the washing machine. And I said, you sit here and you think about what you did. And, uh, and I want you to know my dad sat there for a freaking long time. Okay. And it was all sponsor approved because it's a process, you know, and every time I'd go down to do the laundry, I'd say, Hey, Sarge, guess who's in charge now? Sarge, you know, and girls are better than boys, Sarge. And just, well, all that garbage that I had to spit out and take care of and, and do whatever it was that I had to do with it. And, um, and again, my gratitude towards, you know, um, because, you know, left to my own devices, you know, I'm, I'm the disease of the alcoholic has died, you know, but I am keeping that disease alive when I keep that anger, when I keep that resentment and it serves no one. It absolutely, there's no pleasure in it yet. I don't even know how to stop it, you know, unless I practice these steps, unless I practice the principles that are in these steps, you know, and to, and take that sponsor direction and accept the fact, you know, that my dad was a sick alcoholic. Do I really need to punish him or me or my children or my husband anymore because of it? Or can I just accept the fact this is just the way that it was. Nobody's trying to punish you. Nobody's trying to teach you a lesson. Nobody's trying to do any of that. The facts of life are just your facts of life. And again, but I grew up blaming everybody and it was always somebody else's fault, you know, and why it's, you know, it's especially hard for me to look at myself, even still today, 39 years in, it's like, I got to know to throw that first thought out. It's not somebody else's fault. You're a grown ass woman. What are you going to do about what's going on in your life right now? You know, and that's why I'm still sponsored as actively as I am, because I have to deal with this brain that pretty much gets information from nowhere, lands here, becomes fact for me, and I and I run with that. But anyway, when I was uh, 17, I met my husband, and I should have known there was something really wrong with him because my dad liked him, and that had like, never, ever happened before. And uh, and my husband was uh, seven years older than I am, almost well, eight years older than I am. He'd been married once before, had a kid, back living with his mom and dad. Should have been a clue to me that he was an alcoholic. He also didn't wear underwear, which I think should be in the Al-Anon literature that they, if you're not wearing underwear, you can pretty much guarantee they're an alcoholic. You know, whether or not you agree with that is irrelevant to me. Talk to other alcoholics. They just don't wear underwear. I don't know what the deal is with that. But anyway, um, and we went on this date. We went with this other couple and, um, and I remember stopping at a liquor store and I was 17 years old at the time. And let me tell you, I'm a rule person. I mean, I, I learned early on, follow the rules and regulations, do what the Sarge tells you to do, you know, stay out of trouble, keep your nose clean, do not rock the boat. And, um, and Butch stops at this liquor store and he asked me what I would like to drink. Well, I proceed to, t- I don't drink cause it's against the law to drink for one thing, you know? So I proceed to tell him the laws of this, the drinking laws of the state of California, cause obviously he does not know them or he would not be offering me this beverage. And, um, and I know we heard today what he still hears today when he doesn't want to hear what I'm saying, he heard blah, 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 blah. And he went in and got a gallon of red mountain wine, I guess, if nothing else to impress me with his wine knowledge because I don't know nothing about nothing and um, and we went uh, over to his house and we were with this other couple and we played a game it's called pass out I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it or not but it's a board game you can still get it on ebay Um, it had rules I read the rules I love rules you know and obviously the only way to win this game is to drink now I don't drink because it's against the law to drink but there's another rule in my house that's always been bigger than that. And that is I must win every game I play. I mean, my dad was just, he was adamant about whatever we participated in, in school, neighborhoods, friendly things. It didn't matter. You, you would be victorious. You will win the game. 
don't come in second and don't come home and tell me you came in second. You know, first is the only acceptable thing. We never surrender. We never give up. You will be victorious. So, and so that's the way I was. And, that, and it's still something I have to work on today, that non-competitive thing. It's not always good, you know, especially when I'm playing shoots and ladders with a five-year-old granddaughter and I'm trying to skin her alive because God forbid I don't win at shoots and ladders. I mean, that does not serve me well anymore. And, um, and so I work, I work really, really hard on that. But anyway, we, um, you know, we ended up playing this game. I drank a half a glass of this God awful wine, you know, and, uh, and I won the game. Cause that was, that was a, that's what that was all about. But guess who, guess who drank the rest of it? You know, now I want you to know at 17, boy, I've got a list about what my life is going to be like. I can't wait to get out of that house. I can't wait to marry someone who loves me and who I love, because you can cut the hate between my mom and my dad with a knife at this point. I mean, I just want to marry someone who loves me and I love him and we're going to have nothing but girl children because my dad hated having girl children, you know, and he's not going to drink. You know, I mean, that's just because I at this point, I know that my dad's my dad's a drunk. I never even think of him as an alcoholic. I just think of my dad as just this mean, nasty drunk. And I'm not going to marry anybody that's drinking. But you have to know now I've gone out and up until this point, all I've ever dated is straight A students like myself. My idea of a hot date at 17 is going out with some guy working some mathematical algorithm or science project. You know, that's my hot date. Now I go out with Butch and Butch is a hippie, long hair, long beard, tattoos, and um, like I said, several years older than me. I've never been out with anybody like this before, and what I remember from that day to this is how much fun I had. I have never laughed so hard in my entire life. I mean, he was just so, so much fun, you know, and I can't wait. I cannot wait to go out with him again, but you know, number one on my list is no drinking. And obviously he's a heavy drinker. I mean, he's, he's pretty drunk right now, but you know, again, this is where I will rationalize and justify stand toe to toe with anybody to rationalize and justify my behavior, you know, because again, information from nowhere lands here becomes fact for me. And what I instantly, you know, come up with is, you know, is the difference, you know, because see when my dad is drinking, he wants to yell at you and hit you and make you feel bad about who you are. When my husband's drinking, he just wants to hug you and kiss you and tell you how pretty you are. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I can work with that, okay? Because that's got the potential that only we can see in alcoholics, who you could be. And um, if only you would do what we tell you to do, but we all know that's not going to happen now, is it? So anyway, um, so I started dating Butch pretty exclusively at that point. Um, it was hard for me to date Butch. Uh, basically because he couldn't remember my name, but you can't let a little silly thing like that stop you from going out with an alcoholic. Now, can you? That should be the hardest thing, you know? And I mean, he would call me all the time on the phone, Lorraine, Lucerne, you know, all kinds of weird, bizarre names, but uh, um, he knows my name now pretty well, but it, it took a long time for him to get it. And I always like to tell this story about my name because again, it's one more healing thing with my dad um, that happened because of the A and Al-Anon. And uh, I know my name is weird, Okay. And so, uh, but my dad, I was first born and I was supposed to be a boy and my name was supposed to be Lawrence Edmund Wells Jr. And, um, and no girl name was picked out nor prepared. And so the, when I was born, this is how my dad would tell me the story. It was like, I was devastated, devastated that you were not a boy. And uh, he goes, but because you were first born, you know, I gave you the name Larsine, which my dad told me was the name of a town in Scotland. OK, and my dad was extremely proud of his Scottish heritage. I mean, very much so. So I've been told since, you know, at the beginning of time for me that, you know, my name was the name of the town in Scotland and I should always be extremely proud of it. And I have always been extremely proud of it. Now, fast forward, you know, and I've been through this whole forgiveness exercise. My dad's dead. I've been I've been now and on a while. I'm through this whole forgiveness crapola with my dad. And so I got curious about Larsine Scotland. So again, before Google and computers, you wanted information, you had to go to buildings called libraries. So I go to the library and, uh, and I look up uh, Larsine Scotland and I can't find no such place. No, not, there's no reference for that. So, um, so I go to the reference librarian and I said, you know, I'm trying to find, you know, Larsine Scotland. She goes, well, what do you know about it? Well, I know about it. It's the name of a town in Scotland. That's all I got. So she says, well, let me look into it, you know, come back in a couple of weeks. So I come back in a couple of weeks and I'll never forget. I get the brown manila envelope. I, I take out the piece of paper 
And it says, no such place as Larstein, Scotland. You know, and I am pissed off. You know, I've done this whole Al-Anon forgiveness exercise, working the steps, doing all this stuff. You know, and one more time, you know, it's not working. This is BS because I'm not getting the answer I want. What do you mean there's no, you know, I forgive my dad and this is him stabbing me from the grave. I am pissed off. And so, um, but I have this friend and he's a big golfer and he goes to Scotland every year, you know, to go golf. And he goes, you know, I have a lot of friends in Scotland and maybe there was Larsen, Scotland. It's a really old country. Maybe there was Larsen, Scotland, you know, thousands of years ago. Let me ask my friends in Scotland before, you know, let's see what's going on. So he goes, he comes back two weeks later from Scotland and no one in Scotland has ever heard of Larsen, Scotland. So now I'm going to change my name, fight me dad, because that's how pissed off I am about this. I'm mad at al I'm just mad at the world, you know, and for me, you know, I mean, that rage and that anger, you know, what I've gotten to learn through doing all the inventory work is because I would much rather you see me pissed off than see me hurt. And that's just what it was, because I'm trying to work through this relationship with a father who's no longer alive and make it be okay. And then, you know, and then one more time, just one more thing. And, uh, and, and whenever that happens to me, it's like, there is no God. Al-Anon doesn't work. Sponsors suck. You know, I mean, it's just like, again, problem oriented instead of solution. And so one night I happened to be at my husband's big giant AA speaker meeting. And this friend of his walks up to me, this AA guy. And he says, Larsine, you are not going to believe this, but I found out that Larsine is a Scottish word. I'm like, you are kidding me. He goes, it is Scottish for father was drunk when daughter was born. So daughter got a weird name. Now I know as the minute he told me that, that it was absolutely not true. I knew it just the minute he said it. But what he went on to say to me is he goes, you know what, Larcy? He goes, I believe I'm alcoholic like your dad's alcoholic. And I really believe that when your dad named you Larcy, he believed it was the name of a town in Scotland. And I don't know if he read it wrong or wrote it down wrong or how, what the heck happened. But he goes, but I believe he believed it was the name of a town in Scotland. And just because it's not wrapped the way that you want it to be wrapped doesn't make it any less of a gift. You know, when I got to go home that night and I got to think about that, you know, and I really, and, and for the life of me, you know, and as mean and angry as my dad could be, I really couldn't believe that he would go all to all that trouble to make up that huge giant story just so I could be hurt later on in life. I don't. I believe my dad believed Larsine is the name of a town in Scotland. So several years ago, you know, you know, after I worked through all of that, I got Larsine on my license plate, seven letters. It fits perfect. And then at several years ago, my husband got me license plate holders that say it's the name of a town in Scotland. So and so far, I have literally had two complete strangers come up to me and tell me they have been there. OK, you can't even make this stuff up. You know, but again, left to my own devices, I will change my name. You know, what happens to me in Al-Anon? What happens to me when I work these steps? What happens to me when I work these principles? What happens to me when I go to you for solution? Because I don't know solution. I only know problem. Because what happens to me over and over again is that Al-Anon gives me the shot at a good life. But it's whether or not I'm going to take the shot or not. That's what's up to me. So anyway, um, you know, and then just, you know, fast forward here, you know, Butch and I started dating after we were dating for a few years. I was 19 years old. I became pregnant. I don't care if it's a big deal for you, huge deal for me, because I'm a rule and regulation person. And there's an order things have to be done in. I mean, it's the way I still am today, you know. And again, when I came to al I thought it was about changing everything it was to change about me. It's not. Alan, I want you just to be who you were supposed to be in the first place. And if you're an orderly person, there is nothing wrong with that. But it's when you try and cram those orders down other people's throats and make them march like you march, that that's where it becomes a problem. And um, so anyway, um, so because I did everything out of order, you know, and I had this baby before I was married, I was sure it was because, you know, and when our life got really, really bad behind my husband's uh, drug use and drinking, I was sure it was because God was punishing me because I had broken the big rule and the big regulation. I had to be in Al-Anon a while sharing that story when someone said to me, you know what, Larsine, if you're just going to screw around and not use any birth control, you might just get pregnant. No God's punishing you or after you or doing any of that other stuff. But again, see, I never look at the truth. I'm always this happened and this happens, and then I magnify it to something that's way out of proportion that makes me think there is no answer, there is no solution. 
you know, and, and up until this point, you know, Butch and I got married a couple of months after our son was born. And if you asked me if I was pregnant when I got married, I was not. If you have to figure it out on your own, go ahead. That's not my problem. You know, I just, I wasn't pregnant when I got married. Maybe I had a three month old baby, but you figured that out. Not my job. And, um, and up until that time, I never talked to Butch about his drinking or his drug use ever, you know, but the day after we got married, I sat him in the kitchen chair, boy, and I told him the rules and regulations, and this is how it's going down, buddy, and we're getting a babysitter once a week, and then you can, you know, have a party, but other than that, you're working, you're bringing home a paycheck, do you understand? He nodded his head up and down, which I took as affirmative, what I know today, he was just so drunk and loaded, his head was just doing this bob off thing, you know, and I know that because day three of our marriage, he does not come home all night long, and this is a huge violation of the rules and regulations I have sat down, and I am proud to tell you, proud, proud, proud to tell you, my husband begged begged for the silent treatment. He never got it one time, boy. I was just like a little dog. Every time he'd walk into the house, just yip, 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 and cursing and screaming and, you know, ranting and raving. And he jokes that I talk as fast as I do because I only had so much time from when he came home to when he passed out for me to tell him everything it was that I wanted him to hear because by God, he was going to hear it. You know, and that's just the insanity, the crazy train that I got on because I am trying to make sense you know, I can't believe that I grew, I grew up in an alcoholic home with an alcoholic dad. And now I am married to someone who was doing the same stuff I grew up with. It's like, you know, how did this even begin to happen to me? And again, my innocent victim thing. And one more time, I think that I can make it be different. You know, if I just love him, you know, I'm here to tell you if loving alcoholics could fix them, we wouldn't need Alcoholics Anonymous, nor would we need Al-Anon, you know, but that's just not the way it works. You have to learn to love yourself. That's how it works. And, uh, you know, and I had absolutely no idea, you know, and I want you to know positively the driving force behind Butch and I getting married was the fact that we had this child. There's no doubt about that either. But I want you to know that we got married in a church. We got married in front of a minister. I loved him. I believed he loved me. He was sober that day. And I believe we were as sincere as any two people are when they're getting married, that we wanted to love each other and cherish each other and take care of each other. But what he didn't know and I didn't know was it wasn't just he and got married, he and I that got married that day. It was also the family disease of alcoholism. And I am here to tell you from my own experience that the family disease of alcoholism doesn't love or cherish anything or anybody. And it means to tear your family apart through the alcoholic or the non-alcoholic. It is so irrelevant to the family disease of alcoholism. You know, and then we just had all the craziness and stuff that, you know, goes on in the freaking house that goes on in every alcoholic home. And I didn't understand, you know, because Butch was not violent like my dad was, you know, and he was a loving guy. And every time he did it, you know, or he spent a whole paycheck, you know, when we didn't have diapers or formula, you know, how do you spend an entire paycheck when we're going to be evicted from our apartment? You know, how do you do these things? And then tell me how much you love me and tell me how much you love your son. And I don't understand the disease of alcoholism. Yet every time my husband told me how sorry he was that he wouldn't do it again, I knew he meant it with every fiber of his being. And I believed it because he didn't know that he was alcoholic. He didn't know that once he took that first drink, there was no more promises. There was no more wife. There was no more. And I didn't know that either. You know, and I thought he was drinking at me, you know, because one more time, information from nowhere lands here becomes fact for me. Because you know what? I can drink or not drink. So you know what? That means you can drink or not drink. So that means you're just drinking at me. And that just makes me matter. Because one more time, I am so hurt and I don't understand. So I'd much rather you see me pissed off and angry and yelling and screaming and ranting and raving and doing all the crap that I do, you know, and fast forward and you know we're going to have a family reunion my husband is one of nine kids it's his family reunion I make him raise his right hand promise me he's going to be sober that day and he does because he means to be and guess what that family reunion happens you know and guess who's so drunk and so loaded we can't go and I am so pissed off and I'm here to tell you my husband's a blackout drinker you know all of that kind of stuff goes on but he has never raised a hand to hit me because he's not a violent guy it's just not what he does but that day, that day I was poking him in the chest and I was egging him to hit me. Let's just take it to the next level because all I know how to do is push harder. This is how crazy I am. I am not the alcoholic. I am the sober person in the family. How I am affected by the disease of alcoholism and I can't even see it. 
And by this time, we have two little boys, and I'm they're little bitty kids, and, and all of a sudden, I'm yelling and screaming at my husband, and I see these two little boys, and they're standing on either side of me, yanking at my pant legs, and I look down, big, big tears coming down their little faces. Mommy, mommy, please stop yelling at daddy. I would like to tell you that I had a moment of clarity then, but I absolutely did not. What I started doing was I started screaming at those little boys. How dare they tell me to stop yelling at their dad when he's the reason our life is the piece of crap that it is. By the time I get done screaming at these little boys, I watch my drunken husband go out the front door. And I, the sober mom, say to the drunken husband, where the hell do you think you're going? And the drunken husband turns to the sober mom and says, I'm leaving because we're upsetting the kids. And I don't tell you this story because I'm proud of it. I tell you the story because this is how I'm affected by the disease of alcoholism. And I think I'm the good guy. I really believe it with every fiber of my being. I'm the innocent victim. I can't even see my own behavior. In our al literature where it says, you know, we become nervous and irritable without knowing it. Why? Because we try and force solutions. I'm all about forcing a solution. You know, it's just kind of like, and you're the problem, and you're the problem. You know, and somewhere in all this insanity, I went to my first Al-Anon meeting, you know, and um, and I remember being there and them having all the great literature and, you know, and all the stuff there, but not the piece of literature I want, which is how to get how to get them to stop drinking and do what you want them to do. Because believe you me, that is all I am interested in. I am not interested in all the other literature that's there, the merry-go-round name, denial, understanding ourselves, bite me. I have no interest in that. I am not the problem. He's the problem. You know, fix him. I'll be okay. You know, yet when I was sitting in that front row and they said, Larsine, do you want your life to be different? Oh my God, do I want my life to be different? Larsine, what are you willing to do about it? Nothing because it's not my fault. You fix him. I'll be okay. And I really, really absolutely believe that, you know, and I don't know, another year goes by and, uh, which ended up getting arrested for drunk driving, which for him is no big deal. He gets arrested all the time for drunk driving, but this is in the seventies. And every time you get arrested for drunk driving, it costs you about $500. You get it reduced to reckless. You pay a lawyer, blah, blah, blah. And you're off and running again. But this time something different happened for him. Something different happened. And, um, and I remember picking him up from the police department and, uh, and I didn't say anything. And, uh, and what I think happened that day is God was working in Butch's life. I don't know that God was working in mine, but I know God was working in Butch's life because I didn't say anything. And let me tell you, it takes a power greater than anything in the universe to keep my mouth shut. I'm just telling you, okay, so God was working in his life, because I didn't say a word, and uh, and ended up, you know, a couple of the days, he comes downstairs and makes that understatement of the century that he finally thinks he has a problem, glad you're catching up to the plan here, dude, and uh, yeah, maybe you do, so he ended up going to a hospital program, they just started it, brand new thing, this is 1979, and um, and they didn't do any family, nothing. It was all about the alcoholics. So, but because he was in this program, they told me I should go to an Al-Anon meeting. And so I'm a rule follower, and I do. So I go to my that Al-Anon meeting I'd been to a year earlier, you know. And we save the last ten minutes for newcomers. I raise my hand, you know. I said I was here like a year ago, and I asked you how to get my husband sober, and you did not tell me. So I am not going to tell you how I got him sober now. This is how freaking cocky I am. You know, and even though I couldn't tell you exactly what it was I did to get my husband sober, I was sure it was because I had rode him and pestered him and done all this stuff. And do you know what they said to me at that meeting? They said, keep coming back. And I am here to tell you, if you're at a meeting, AA or Al-Anon, and you share something and they tell you to keep coming back, it is because you said the most asinine BS crapola in the universe. It's your only freaking hope until your head pops out of your ass. That's all you got. They can't even do nothing for you, you know, because you are that far gone. You have to keep coming back until that happens. And even though we've been doing the Zoom thing, that's the one thing I miss in Zoom meetings, you know, that you don't get to hear in regular meetings because everybody's muted. But I love the sound when I'm in a meeting because every so often at an Al-Anon meeting, I will hear someone's head pop out of their butt. It's the best sound in the universe because it's somebody finally is getting it. And I understand you know, because it's really hard when you're the good guy all the time, when you think you're the good guy to actually have to see where you've been wrong, you know, your part in what happened, taking responsibility for your own life. It's hard for us family members because you guys always do such spectacular stuff. You know, you lose vehicles. How do you lose vehicles that weigh thousands of pounds? You know, and then and then I would say to my husband, where's your truck? You know what? 
an alcoholic says to you when you ask them where their truck is? They say, what truck? Like they never had one to begin with. This is the insanity, you know, that we deal with on a constant basis that makes us feel like we are so wonderful. And, you know, and that's the crazy part of it. That is the absolute crazy part of it. But anyway, so Butch gets sober. Yay, you know, and, you know, and it was fabulous. And I am grateful. I make no joke about you know, my gratitude to Alcoholics Anonymous is an ending, you know, because I, my, I believe my husband was very close to death. And, uh, and I want AA to know you saved the life of a really, really good man. I wasn't happy about it, you know, because I really wanted him to die. That was my plan. Um, somebody said to me, why didn't you just divorce him and let him win? I don't think so. That's not how it goes down in my house. He's going out feet first because I will be victorious. And, uh, you know, and, and I think about if that had happened, you know, and I always get teary eyed about which is sobriety. And when that happened, it's not because he got sober. You know, I always get teary eyed because I think about if my husband had died, like I wanted him to, and I want you to think about me, that really angry, angry person. And I want you to think about those two little boys. And I want you to think 41 years later, what kind of a family do you think we would be? Because, I mean, the alcoholic might start you off, but it's the alcoholism, the family disease of alcoholism that will finish you off. I have no doubt. I would have just carried that anger, passed it on to those two little kids. Good Lord no, only knows what it could be like. I am so grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous. So anyway, Butch gets sober and you know how you guys are when you get sober. It's like Jiminy Christmas, put on a cape, you know, you're like big giant heroes now. And it's just like, it just cracks me up. It's like, give me the checkbook, you know, I'm like, you're out of your mind. And, uh, and I would go to AA in the beginning with Butch to make sure he elbow him to make sure he heard what he needed to hear, you know, cause I wasn't going down and on, there was nothing wrong with me. And, uh, you know, and, and in, you know, and in, in defense of, of family members, I want you to know when you're new and you and you bring your family to AA, it's, it's a little confusing for us sometimes, you know, it's just like you're at this big AA meeting and then some guy gets up to the podium and he's got his driver's license, you know, and the whole place comes unglued because the guy's got a driver's license. I mean, I, what, I have had a driver's license a long time. You know, I mean, it's just kind of like you have to start wrapping your head around it. Today, I appreciate what that is all about. But as a new person, I'm thinking well, you guys kind of set the bar kind of low, you know, just need a driver's license and everybody's happy. You know, I just don't quite get that part. And apparently, if you have a driver's license, uh, a registered car and car insurance, it is the trifecta of Alcoholics Anonymous. So there you go. And um, so in the beginning, you know, to me, AA was just like, blah. And it was scary, but I was glad my husband was sober. And then what ended up happening is he ended up being sober for a couple of years. And um, and let me tell you, I had always said when Butch is sober, when Butch is a good husband, when Butch starts providing for our family, when he's a good dad, I thought all those things would fix me. And two years into my husband's sobriety, I was as angry as I've ever been in my life. And no one was more shocked than me that his sobriety didn't fix me. You know, because again, one more time, I didn't know happiness is an inside job. I grew up with the information that other people are supposed to make you happy. And that was, you know, and again, I've gotten to learn. I got a lot of misinformation from people with a lot of misinformation. And, uh, and so what ended up happening for me is I'm a very task oriented, you know, the motto in my home is there is no fun till the chores are done. And uh, that particular day was laundry day. And I remember doing the laundry and I had the basket in my hand and the boys are in the living room with their sober dad. They're laughing, carrying on, da, 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 da. da. And I set foot in the living room and I suck the joy right out of the room because there is no more laughter. That's what I bring to the family. And I remember going through that living room and I heard God's voice in my head as clear as a bell. And what I heard God say to me is, you, you are your dad. And even though I was an alcoholic like my dad, boy, I was trying to run that family with an iron fist, intimidation, humiliation, embarrassment, whatever I could, because I'm so afraid they're going to slip through my fingers. And I don't think you get a message like that, that you don't get the answer. And the answer was, this is not who you were supposed to be. And I knew, and I knew it wasn't who I was supposed to be. You know, and so, you know, and so I started coming to Allen on two years after Butch got sober and I didn't come to get him sober or keep him sober. I came because I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. 
I was sick and tired of being angry all the time. I was sick and tired of trying to control and manipulate the entire universe and all the crap that goes along with it. And again, how grateful I am, you know, to the sponsorship that I got right out of the gate and, um, you know, and being included and, and taken to things and working on myself. You know, I remember the first time I used my sponsor, Jeannie, Butch had a dead battery. And he asked me to jump it, and I did, and he ran out of gas, and that pissed him off. And he yelled, so I yelled right back at him. He stormed off to work. I called, I went upstairs, called my sponsor, and reported his behavior, because I am a good reporter of other people's bad behavior. And I remember telling Jeannie what happened, and she said, when he gets home, you owe him an apology. And another thing, she said, don't you ever start a conversation with what Butch said or did. I don't care what he said or did. I'm not his sponsor. I'm your sponsor. And what comes out of your mouth, you need to take responsibility for. You know, and that night when my husband walked in, I walked right, marched right up to him. And I told him, I said, I'm sorry, I let your shitty attitude affect me the way that it did. And I'll try and do better in the future. Now, that may not be the best amends you've ever heard, but I'm here to tell you. It's the first time I ever said, even attempted to take responsibility for what came out of my mouth. And that's what it's about. It isn't about doing it perfectly. It's about doing your best. This much willingness. This much willingness to take the guidance of someone who wants me to have the shot at a good life. That's what happens to me in this program over and over and over again. You know, um, real quick, um, you know, um, when I came home from my meeting, I have several years in the program. um, My husband tells me my youngest son has dropped acid. He is 12 years old. And um, and. I am freaking out. I come over from my Al-Anon meeting. I'm like, oh my God. And my husband's like, don't worry. He's drinking milk and listening to Mozart. Apparently that's what you're supposed to do when you drop acid. I have no idea. Thank God my husband knew, you know, but I wasn't going to let it go that way. You know, I spent all night long in that bedroom with that kid because I wasn't going to leave him alone, you know, and apparently having your mother in your face on your very first acid trip is not fun. Apparently it's not a good acid trip. And um, I've never apologized for that, and I have no intention of ever apologizing for it. But uh, but that set off the roller coaster with with my youngest son Earl. And um, and again, one more time, I am devastated by this. You know, I can't. You know, first of all, he started with he he's dropped acid. Oh my God, he's it's not even in order. I've been to AA. You can't just drop acid. You got to start with marijuana and work your way up. Not only has he done a terrible thing, he hasn't even done it in order, which is just blowing my mind. And, uh, you know, and then again, one more time. And what do I do nine years into the program or whatever? One more time. I think I know what I'm supposed to do. I've got the books and I try and do it by myself. You know, and, and I'm here to tell you, I think the hardest thing is always to ask for help. It still is today. 39 years in, it's still hard for me to ask for help. But it's the only way my answers come, you know, and so I struggled for quite a while, you know, thinking, you know, oh, I got it. I'm okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know when I'm dying inside, you know, and several years into my son's, you know, drinking and using, it was just kind of like how much has to happen to me? How much has to happen to me before I am honest that this is killing me? You know, I remember going to my sponsor going, how am I supposed to be happy, joyous and free when I have a kid who could die? And I remember her telling me, and I'll always be so grateful. Because if you're not happy, joyous, and free, Larsen, you show that kid no hope. And that's your responsibility here. Things aren't always going to go your way. The fact that your husband's sober in AA and you're in Al-Anon is not immunity for your children. It's not immunity from anything. What it is is it gives you the shot at a good life no matter what is going on in your life. Then what am I supposed to do? I told her. She says, you're going to practice unconditional love. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to look up unconditional. And I did. And you know what it says? No conditions really hard to find a loophole and no conditions, you know, and in reality, that's the truth. I love my kid. There's nothing that's going to make me not love my kid, but unacceptable behavior is unacceptable behavior, you know, and that meant when he came to our house, he had to be sober. And if he wasn't sober, he couldn't come. And so, uh, and so that meant sometimes he could come for Christmas. And I remember him coming one time for Christmas and he didn't even stay for 10 minutes. He couldn't stay for more than 10 minutes. It's a heartbreaker. But what I got to do again, calling my sponsor, you got 10 minutes. You'd be real grateful for that. You know, and that's what I got to focus on, just what I could be grateful for and uh, and always let him know that I loved him. And I, and, and she taught me how to love him for who he was, where he was, not for what I wanted him to be or where I thought he was going to end up or what was going to happen, how important it is to live in the moment and love that kid unconditionally. And I'm very, very, very grateful for that. And, uh, And he had a road to go. And then when he was uh, 36 years old, 
he turned himself finally into Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, and I am so grateful. And uh, he just celebrated seven years. And I am ecstatic about that. I mean, it's just, it's just wonderful. You know, I like in having a kid who's an alcoholic. It's like having your kid kidnapped. I just don't even know how else to say it. It's just like he's there, but he's not there anymore. And, uh, you know, and to have Alcoholics Anonymous restore him to life, like I watched it restore my husband to life, is just like a, such a fabulous gift. And, um, and I don't mean to imply that my son got sober, you know, because of Al-Anon or Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm here to tell you my son got sober for the same reason I got in Al-Anon. I think for the same reason anybody gets sober or gets into Al-Anon. We say, you know, but for the grace of God, I believe it's but for the acceptance of God's grace. Because God's grace is available to everybody and anyone who walks the planet. It's whether or not those windows of grace open that you accept it into your life. You know, and when I'm and, and when I ask for help and I ask, you know, and I talk to a sponsor, you know, that's letting God's grace in because left to my own devices, I will think bad things, you know, and I will take, you know, run, run to the hills with it. You know, just most recently, my husband got diagnosed in June with liver cancer. Mind blower for me. He'd been sick, really sick with hepatitis for a long time. And I thought we were over that hump. And so now he has liver cancer and um, and I freak out. Like I always do, because that's what I do. I'm not going to pretend 39 years. I don't. And so, um, but so I'm like talking to the doctors and they say liver transplant. So I'm all over liver transplant. I'm at USC. I'm hauling them to USC. We're doing the liver transplant interviews and all this other kind of stuff. And, and I remember after leaving, after he did all this blood test and stuff, he turns to me, he goes, well, I've seen I'm almost 74 years old. I am not going to do a liver transplant. I don't want anything to do with it. It's not what I want to have happen to me. And he goes, and I need you to, respect that. I need you to love me and I need you to support me and I need you to respect my decision because it's my body. You know, and my initial thing right away is, well, maybe it's your body, but your liver is in a body that belongs to my husband. So somehow I will rationalize that I have a say over what's going on here because that's just what's going on. But in reality, I talk to my sponsor and what's the truth? Your job is to be the wife, not the husband. We all know you'd make a better husband, but it's not your job. You just get to be the wife. So be the best loving wife you can and support your husband through whatever it is that he's going through. And I'm here to tell you right here, right now, he's just finished radiation and all that other kind of stuff. Right here, right now, we're doing just fine. And I don't want to miss just fine anymore and living in fear and living in apprehension about what's going to happen, when it's going to happen. You know, it's like everyone else has shared, you know, life is happening and it's in session. And I don't want to miss one ounce of joy you know, because I'm living in the fear you know, and I'm not going to be hurt anymore or anything else like that. God has blessed us beyond belief, beyond absolute belief. I have a life beyond my wildest dreams. I get the shot at a good life if I so choose to take it every day. You guys have given me those tools and I am not going to miss it. You know, it says in the big book, you know, what's God's will for us? To be happy, joyous, and free. What do I do to honor that? That's my job to honor that. I hope you guys honor that. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.